Japan's Prime Minister is under mounting popular anger over the US military base in Okinawa that strained ties with Washington. Just why is the base important to the US? And how has Washington benefited from its massive military presence across the globe? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the programme. I'm Sahil Rahman, stuck in between a rock and a hard place as Japanese Prime Minister Yokio Hatoyama plans a visit to Okinawa to settle the row over the US airbase on the island. On one hand, he has to appease the residents of Okinawa, and on the other, he can't afford to strain relations with Washington. The bone of contention is the Marine Corps air station Futenma. It's located in Jinawan City on the island. As Okinawa's population grew, the airbase became part of a crowded city. And for years, many residents have been concerned about flights over residential areas, causing noise and air pollution and endangering public safety. The issue gathered new momentum when at least 90,000 people, including the governor of Okinawa, gathered in a protest rally on Sunday. They want the base to be relocated outside the island, as promised by the Japanese prime minister before being elected. We ask for a solution that's in line with the campaign pledge. The government must show a responsible solution, especially on the issues surrounding the Fotima Air Base. Well, the Prime Minister says he's taking into account the concerns of the people protesting. I believe that the extremely huge rally held by the people of Okinawa was definitely an indication of public opinion. We'd like to reiterate that we hope to further ease the burden of the Okinawa people and eliminate the dangers of Futenma Air Base. I will continue to make efforts with these thoughts in mind. Well, this dispute comes amid failing plans to find a new location for the Futenma Air Base in Okinawa. But why does the U.S. have such a huge presence in Japan? Well, following World War II, the U.S. occupied Okinawa but returned it in 1975. The American bases remained intact and of the 52 bases that remain in the country, 33 are on the island. Washington refers to them as the keystone of the Pacific due to their ideal strategic location. They serve as a launch pad for the U.S. military in the event of, for example, war with North Korea. And due to China's rising influence, Washington is keen to increase its presence in Japan. Well, there's a full background for you. Let's join our guests now who join me on this edition of Inside Story. In Vancouver, Satoko Norimatsu, the founder of the Peace Philosophy Center and the member of the Network for Okinawa in Providence, Rhode Island in the United States. Steve Rabson, he's a professor of East Asian Studies at Brown University and in Seoul, South Korea. Bruce Klingner, he's a senior research fellow on Northeast Asian Affairs at the Heritage Foundation. That's a Washington, D.C.-based think tank. To all of my guests, welcome to the program. Uh, Satoko Norimatsu, can I begin with you in Vancouver? Why is it such a difficult issue to try and find a solution to the Okinawa problem? Well, for the Hatoyama administration, it, they had pledged before the election that at least they would find a solution, a replacement for Futema Air Station uh, outside of uh, Okinawa. They promised that, and that's how they got elected. The people of Okinawa uh, elected uh, the Hatoyama uh, government on that ground. Uh, but then, uh, because, of, because of the U.S. pressure or because of the um, political situation inside the new uh, government, it became increasingly uh, <coughs> difficult for uh, Prime Minister Hatoyama to uh, follow through uh, his promise um, before uh, the, the election. Sure. And also there were differences uh, within uh, the government that com you know, uh, c comprised of uh, three different parties um, with uh, quite a, a a spectrum of um, um, political uh, stance. Indeed, yeah, the Japanese uh, government at the moment so, is a coalition. Um, Let me just bring in Steve Rabson. Um, if I just bring in Steve yeah. Rabson here very quickly, just we're just trying to get uh, a brief uh, nose bite into all of these uh, issues. Uh, Steve Rabson, uh, is this whole issue becoming a thorn in the side? And uh, how do you think, for example, Japan and the Japanese government can get out of it with their reputation intact? Well, it's an important observation uh, that Ms. Norimatsu made that one of the campaign promises of, of Prime Minister Hatoyama was that he would move the base outside of Okinawa. 
and uh, now he's being uh, under immense pressure to to essentially cave in to this to this campaign promise. They've been going back and forth on this, proposing alternate locations, but it seems increasingly clear that um, he may, in fact, agree to uh, the base within Okinawa in some kind of reduced situation, not the original proposal. Um, the, the American government has pointed out that the, it was a commitment made by the previous administration, by the conservative party when they were in power. They lost the election to the Democratic Party. The Democrats are now in power. And of course, um, Defense Secretary Gates said, you have to honor the previous promise. But the Okinawa Times had a very interesting editorial in which they pointed out that uh, President Bush had promised to build anti-missile radar sites in the Czech Republic and in Poland and that as soon as uh, President Obama was elected, he canceled that agreement. Sure. So it's not as if a sovereign country can't change its mind when they, uh, when they make an agreement with a previous government. Indeed, I'm hoping to come to that point later. Let me bring in Bruce uh, Klingner here, who's in Seoul, and it's very late there in Seoul. Uh, Bruce, um, in, in terms of what we're hearing, and we know the background now to, to what's been going on, I mean, just give us an idea of how this relationship between what is the new Japanese government and a new American administration is working. Is this issue about Okinawa souring the relationship? Uh, very much so. I, I talked with uh, officials in the Obama administration in both the State Department and Defense Department before I came out to Asia, uh, and they described the, this issue as having had a corrosive effect on the, uh, on the alliance and that it's, if it's not solved uh, correctly, uh, one official said it'd be hard to see how the alliance doesn't take on heavy water. So it clearly has strained uh, relations between Washington and Tokyo. Uh, Sotoko, uh, Nanamatsu, if it has strained relations between the United States and Japan, is there any real reason, f in your opinion, for the US to be on Japanese soil anymore? Or do you think you still need them, or, or the Japanese still need a US presence with regards to other regional issues uh, and possible flashpoints that could um, emerge? Yes, um, the U.S. has a very good reason for wanting to uh, stay in Japan because uh, Japan uh, pays a, a lot of money, um, what it's called a host nation support, um, about 75 percent of the, the total uh, expense of the uh, U.S. military presence in Japan. And Japan pays more than uh, a total of uh, 25 or so. Um, of other you know, U.S. allies um, around the world. So uh, it's a, a very you know, lucrative uh, position for the United States to be in Japan. Um, I think, I believe that the U.S. is aware that there's not much strategic value for the U.S. Marines to be in Japan, uh, let alone in Okinawa. But they don't want to leave there because, um, it, it, you know, because of this very generous host nation support. Um, by Japan uh, and also there are forces uh, um, in within Japan um, that um, th you know that are moving towards keeping the US force forces in Japan um, for example for this construction of a new uh, base uh, within Okinawa um, there are you know um, businesses uh, that benefit uh, from building a new uh, base and even some of the, um, a, a few of the local politicians and local businesses and all this military industry complex you know, in Japan and the U.S., you know, trying to benefit from uh, the military buildup in Guam and also uh, an additional uh, base in, in Okinawa. So okay, those well are the forces the, that, that want to see you know, more military expansion. If that's, yeah. your, if that's your opinion in terms of the financial uh, benefit that the, that the U.S. gains, for example. Um, uh, Bruce, you were shaking your head just a few moments ago. Were you disagreeing with some of the issues uh, that um, so, so Kato had actually uh, raised there? Or y was yes, it uh, basically, I I'd like to know whether you think that there should be a military presence uh, on, on Japan's uh, land at all? Right, right. Uh, under, under the bilateral security treaty between the United States and Japan, Washington is obligated to not only defend Japan, but also to maintain peace and stability in the region. There's uh, two, two commitments for the United States. Uh, in order to do so, it needs a, a, a well-balanced force of, of naval, air force, marine corps, 
uh, presence in a forward deployed presence west of the Pacific. And as you pointed out, Okinawa is a very geostrategically important region. Uh, the Marines themselves play an integral role for the defense of Japan, including the Senkakus. Uh, also, they have an integral role in uh, Op Plan 5027, which is the defense of South Korea. Uh, they also play a critical role for what's called a non-combatant emergency operation uh, to evacuate U.S. citizens from both South Korea and Taiwan, uh, and there are also Chinese scenarios. So as Mr. Hadiyama and Mr. Okada and the uh, Ministry of Defense's own uh, internal think tank have all said the Marine Corps' uh, uh, presence in Okinawa is, is irreplaceable. So uh, Japan recognizes the, the need for uh, the, the forward deployed uh, Marine Corps. Uh, it's just right now Mr. Hadayama is, is suffering plummeting public approval in Japan uh, because he's made promises to, to many different groups and now he's finding it very difficult to keep all those promises. Uh, Steve Robson, let me bring you in here, because it seems that now that the mere presence yes, or name uh, 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 of the U.S. On, on Japanese soil is like red, ra red rag to a bull, really, to Japanese society. I'd like to take issue with uh, what Bruce just said about the integral role of the Marines uh, in, in defending Japan and in maintaining stability in East Asia. A study by the Brookings Institute uh, some uh, a, a few years ago determined that there aren't even enough naval capacity on Navy ships of the United States to transport the Marines to uh, any possible trouble spot on the Korean Peninsula or in the Taiwan Straits. So they're, uh, they're really kind of useless uh, in a crisis. The Marines are in Okinawa, as they are in other places, to train. And when they train, they train for wars elsewhere. Marines are now being sent to, from Okinawa to Afghanistan and to Iraq. They were sent to the first Gulf War. They were sent to Vietnam uh, when, when I was a, a, a soldier back in the 19, late 1960s. And they were sent, of course, to Korea. So their purpose in, in Okinawa is basically to train, not to defend Japan, not for any contingency in East Asia, but just to train for anything that the United States government wants to use them for. Now, as far as they're being strategic in a strategic location, um, Okinawa is about 5,000 miles from Iraq. The main marine base is on the east coast of the United States, at Camp Lejeune in uh, North Carolina, for example. That's 6,000 miles from Iraq. So I don't think there's any great strategic value in having them stationed there. And as Ms. Norimatsu mentioned, the main attraction is that it's cheap. The Japanese government pays all of their expenses in maintenance, in repairs. They hire Japanese workers at Japanese government expense to do the clerical work on the bases, to serve customers at the PXs and at the commissaries, to uh, keep their golf courses trimmed. Um, it's, it's really a matter of, of, of financial convenience. Okay, well, and I think the study by the Brookings Institution proves that they don't really serve a strategic function uh, in the area. Okay, well, if we're going to, Bruce, you're shaking your head in disapproval, or certainly you don't agree with what uh, Steve is right. saying. I'll let you come in here. Right, yeah. It, uh, the Marine Corps plays an integral role. They are in phase one and phase three of Operation uh, 5027, which is the defense of South Korea. They're there. It doesn't matter what uh, the Brookings study has, is that they, they are a part of the U.S. war plan for Korea. They uh, are there for full spectrum response, not only in Korea, uh, but other uh, you know, defense, not only of Japan, but throughout the region. So, they, they do play a role. Okay. Uh, one of the, the effects of this dispute between U.S. and, and uh, Tokyo is the, the increased nervousness by other Asian nations. Taiwan, South Korea, Singapore, Vietnam, Indonesia, several others have gone to both Tokyo and Washington expressing concern about the strains in the U.S.-Japan uh, relationship because they see their own, their own security as integrally uh, tied to a strong U.S.-Japan relationship, including the presence of the U.S. Marines on Okinawa. Okay, so we talked about the, the American uh, position here to a certain extent and how the military uh, react. Uh, Ms. Norimatsu, can you just give us a sense, really, even though you're in Vancouver, of how, um, how difficult this is becoming, really, for the Japanese government? Uh, and it is a coalition government where one of the parties may walk out uh, if the Prime Minister doesn't abide by the promises he made pre-election. Yes. Um it, uh, the differences within the coalition government have cer certainly uh, posed a challenge for um, Hatoyama government, but um, 
uh, Prime Minister uh, Hatoyama, even uh, before e election, was talking about the um, um, the AMPO, the security treaty, uh, without the stationing of all these U.S. Uh, troops in Japan. And I believe that he sincerely uh, wished um, the you know, Okinawans be uh, free of all these uh, military uh, bases. Um, he has a true sympathy um, for them. And, you know, Okinawa has um, had more than, more, you know, uh, uh, incredible um, burden of military bases for this, you know, 65 years um, after the war, for all the noise and crime and environmental damage and accidents, you know, that caused and, you know, in 0.6% uh, percent of the total Japanese land, which is um, Okinawa, mm -hmm. in about 75% uh, percent of the U.S. military uh, bases, you know, in such a small um, island. And it's such an unfair uh, burden, you know. And you know, you might talk about strategic value of you know uh, marines um, in Japan, and uh, which I very much doubt. But even even if that's true, there's really no uh, reason why why the Okinawans have to bear um, so much burden. Okay. And so that's fine. That, I want to bring so that that's um, yeah, that's you know, uh, that's the challenge, and that's yeah. Yeah, there's a slight sound delay there, but uh, we'll, we'll come back straight to you uh, as well, Ms. Uh, Norimatsu, because, of course, Japan is not the only country that has a U.S. military presence. They're deployed all over the world, Asia, Latin America, the Middle East and Europe, to name but a few. Some estimates claim that over uh, a thousand bases are scattered outside of the U.S. Um, Steve Rabson, let me just bring you in here. I mean, the mere presence of U.S. bases on foreign lands um, can upset some of the, the local indigenous people. And we've seen in the past um, Saudi, uh, American bases on Saudi soil, for example, moving out of one particular country and moving maybe next door or within the region. Um, do you think that is in any way a possibility or an option either for the Japanese or for the US? Yeah, an option being the US forces moving out of Japan to some neighboring um, area? Yes. Are you asking me that? That's right. Okay, well, there's, al there's already there's already an agreement that uh, that the Bush administration concluded with the uh, Japanese government the con under the Conservatives that about half of the Marine Division in Okinawa is going to go to Guam. Uh, I mean, that's the agreement. It, it may or may not happen in the future, but this was an agreement. Uh, part of the agreement was that the Japanese government would continue, or the American government, or the Japanese government would continue to agree to the new Marine air base in Okinawa. Well, now there's uh, opposition in Guam. Of course, uh, there's opposition to American bases uh, in other countries, as there would be op opposition in the United States to foreign bases coming here. Uh, th there are crimes, there are accidents, uh, there are uh, training incidents, uh, there's uh, overcrowding, um, there's environmental damage. Of course, it, uh, it causes problems. So one of the problems in Okinawa is that no other prefecture would welcome the Okinawan uh, uh, U.S. military presence. There's this not in my backyard syndrome where the other prefectures don't want it either and they have more political clout because they're bigger. Okinawa only has a uh, million three hundred thousand people. So um, yes, uh, there are moves to move, uh, there are moves to transfer bases and forces from one place to another, but these cause problems in and of themselves. Well, uh, let me bring in uh, Bruce again, because um, it seems that regardless of where you move American troops or whether they stay within Japan, um, there will always be a reason perhaps that America can use for staying there or not as a case. And uh, can we just bring in um, the recent incident of uh, the sinking of a, a South Korean warship, for example, under suspicious circumstances uh, right. just off the coast of South Korea? That could be one example used by both the Japanese administration and the American administration for making sure that there is an American presence on Japanese soil for security reasons. R right. It, it's uh, in discussions with South Korean officials this this week. It, it seems unlikely that South Korea will respond militarily, but it, it, it does show the kind of situation that, uh, with little or no warning, can can spring up here on the Korean Peninsula, uh, or th really throughout the region, and so. Uh, you know, the, the Marine Corps is the only rapidly deployable uh, ground force the United States has between Hawaii uh, and India. So it's something that, uh, you know, you want to have, you know, it's the quick response force uh, for the United States. You know, and just to point out the, you know, the 
trying to reduce the, the U.S. military footprint on Okinawa. Uh, that's the basis for the Guam agreement. Uh, under the agreement, the, uh, the Marine Corps moving from Futenma to Camp Schwab, uh, which, Camp Schwab is only a third of the size of Futenma, and then also 70 percent of the bases south of Kadena would also be returned to Okinawa. So it, it would be uh, a way of reducing the U.S. military footprint there uh, if the Guam agreement is carried out. Uh, if Mr. Hadayama decides not to uh, fully implement it, uh, you know, by building Camp Schwab or some alternative air base, uh, then the agreement falls through, and then the 8,000 Marines don't move from Okinawa to Guam. Uh, the U.S. doesn't give up Futenma, and then you have, uh, I think, greater uh, tension uh, on Okinawa. So it's something that the U.S. hopes that the Guam agreement can be carried out in that way, uh, you know, reduce hopefully some of the tension with Okinawa by reducing its footprint there. Well, Steve Rabson, is there not a nervousness within the American administration, reducing troops in Iraq, increasing them uh, in Afghanistan, uh, a redeployment within the Gulf itself? And we only have to look to the beginning of April and the uprising in Kyrgyzstan, which brought in an interim government, uh, and even for the American administration, with a military base in that country, not quite sure where they stood with them. Well... In general, I would say that the United States has put much too much reliance, um, uh, especially at the end of, after the end of the Cold War, on military solutions to uh, international problems. What we need to do is concentrate more on training people who understand the cultures and languages of other nations, who can serve as skilled diplomats, who can negotiate uh, and uh, and interact with with other countries in a, in a more in a more uh, positive way, in a more rational way, maybe. Uh, I think we forget that toward the end of the Clinton administration, the United States and North Korea were very close to a rapprochement. Uh, Secretary of State Albright had gone to North Korea. North Korean officials had come here. Then when the Bush uh, administration came in, uh, into power, all of that collapsed with his putting of North Korea among the axis of evil na nations, and things uh, collapsed. Uh, North and South Korea had a summit meeting uh, in which the president of South Korea went to Seoul. It seemed like things were moving in the right direction uh, uh, at one point. Mm -hmm. um, and I, by the way, the Hatoyama administration, to, what they're to, doing now is they're brief. reaching just out to, to China in particular. We just need you to be brief and get okay. to the end, if I'm you sorry. can. So we just um, want to run out of time. And, and trying to emphasize diplomacy, emphasizing Im improved relations over military uh, encounters. But That's, we shall I think, see. a very import, important point here. Well, we sh indeed it is, and we shall see uh, what happens in the coming days. Uh, to my guests in Vancouver, in Rhode Island, and in Seoul, thanks very much for joining us on this edition of the programme, and thank you for joining us on Inside Story. We welcome your suggestions. Please do email them to us at insidestory at aljazeera.net. I'm Sahil Rahman. Thanks very much for your time and your company. Bye.